Patrick Mendes, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, a very warm welcome to all our participants who have joined us uh, from different parts of the globe. From the US, Dominique, uh, we have also from South Africa, from uh, Taiwan, from uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, several other countries. So thank you so much. This is the first session of our webinar series, which are being held every Wednesday since the middle of May. And uh, very successfully, we are organizing these webinars and we are also sharing the entire recording of webinars on our Facebook page of Association of Asia Scholars. Our association uh, is the alumni of the Asian Scholarship Foundation. Over 10, we were al almost 300 of us, and uh, we are all now placed in senior positions in different universities, institutions, uh, think tanks, government. And uh, we, we came together in 2005 as a registered body. So for the last 15 years, we have been organizing conferences, workshops, uh, national, international, along with several other institutions in India and abroad. There are several publications to our credit and uh, uh, several books, which are also mentioned on our website. And our biggest achievement has been our uh, SAGE published uh, journal which uh, started as a biannual, uh, and now we are in the 11th year of publication of our journal. And uh, the journal is being taken care of uh, Millennial Asia by our chief editors, Professor Akwinder Singh and Professor Supal Singh. They have been taking care of uh, you know, reviewing and uh, getting with the peer reviews done for the submissions Maybe for our journal already listening then. so we are uh, we have three issues a year now and from next year it's going to be four issues a year professor lakwinder singh is with us today and i would request him to just uh, say two sentences uh, briefly about our journal because it's a great that he's here today and uh, we are also looking forward to our international conference on Gandhi on 30th, 31st of but exactly a month from today. And uh, those papers also will be published in the form of a book. And maybe if uh, some can be published in a special issue of the journal. So, Professor Lakwinder, may I please request you to just say a few sentences about our journal, which is in its 11th year journey now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reena Marwaha, uh, Society, Dr. Swaran Singh, other dignitaries uh, who are sitting on the dais, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, the Association of Asia Scholars has made a lot of efforts to reach out to the scholars through its journal called Millennial Asia and International Journal of Asian Studies. It has been published by the very well-known published international publisher, Sage Publications. And uh, this journal is being published uh, uh, three issues in a year. This year, we are bringing out a special issue on COVID and the uh, Asian uh, uh, Asian economies. So the special issue is going to be in the end of November this year. Uh, the journal is being indexed in the Scopus as well as in various other uh, uh, organizations of which are indexing. Uh, even in India, the University Grants has recognized it. And therefore, you'll find a large number of scholars now are uh, doing submissions and its peer review process is uh, relatively going very well. And you will find that uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of quality of the journal is relatively higher and higher. 
so some of these scholars which uh, you know getting uh, good comments but not able to publish they are also being benefited because of the higher quality review process which we have been uh, undertaking so i would like to thank the president and the secretary for encouraging us to you know take this journal to further heights and uh, one of the very important partners in this uh, uh, project is uh, professor sukpal singh iam ahmedabad so we are jointly editing this journal and we are enjoying that and uh, looking into it that uh, it is uh, moving higher and higher so we are very happy with the support of the association of asia scholars as well as the sage publications so we thank you all and we, i request you all of you to kindly take into consideration that this is a good journal it is a multidisciplinary journal so anybody who submits uh, his or her article it is being uh, reviewed the the two process of review first is the team of uh, editorial team reviews the articles and in the second stage the independent referees uh, blind refereeing is being done and two referees uh, uh, are being uh, uh, you know uh, considered and they, their comments are being final in terms of taking carry, uh, carrying forward the article or not so with these words i thank the uh, uh, organizers giving me an opportunity to speak to you but i will request you all to kindly you know consider uh, uh, for quality publication in the journal millennial asia and international journal of asian studies thank you very much thank you so much professor lakwinder that was really wonderful uh, professor swaran singh will now formally introduce the speaker to us Thank you, uh, Professor Rina Marwa. I also wish to acknowledge the uh, presence of Professor Lakhvinder Singh, who is the chief editor of our Millennial Asia uh, Sage published journal. Uh, I also wish to acknowledge the uh, presence of uh, several friends of the speaker today, especially if they are uh, sitting at late night in, in United States. Uh, also, uh, acknowledge. attendance of all our participants uh, in fact i often uh, underline the fact that it is the participants who have made uh, these webinars uh, so successful so far so your indulgence is most welcome uh, today's speaker is a, a friend of uh, several of us in the like some of you uh, we too have co-authored <laughs> uh, so i have had the pleasure of uh, knowing uh, dr mendes for some time now Uh, but maybe few of you may not be uh, very familiar and uh, like some of our earlier speakers uh, he also combines this very interesting experience of both being the practitioner in making an implementation of the policy uh, but also as a very very deeply rooted academic uh, to analyze some of those uh, trends in policy that, that are always of interest to us here Uh, for instance uh, we have had speakers earlier at least two definitely uh, who made presentations on indo pacific uh, but this is a unique presentation today that uh, looks at very interestingly two islands and it was uh, simply when some time ago i spent some time in sri lanka that you know i developed this completely different perspective uh, on how island territories uh, next to mainland in a case of south asian subcontinent sri lanka in case of east asia united uh, china it is taiwan but most interesting 18th and 19th century britain being away from the mainland of uh, europe and how these island nations can wield enormous leverages Now, by ensuring that aloofness uh, from the mainlands that they are next to located, and I think it's a very interesting context where the sole surviving superpower, as the speaker will narrate to us, is extremely conscious of this geopolitical advantage of islands. Now, in this case, we are talking of two islands, uh, Sri Lanka and Taiwan, and how. both the sole surviving superpower and, and the aspirant superpower uh, are engaging these islands as their 
kind of springboards to launch their initiatives and visions in this larger Indo-Pacific region. So we haven't heard any such uh, the speaker so far looking at this very unique geopolitical perspective of how islands uh, are becoming kind of springboards uh, for major parts. So Britain is an example of itself being a great power. But today, how these two islands are being seen by the great powers as their springboard into implementing their visions. So I'm personally looking forward to the, the presentation today. And let me briefly mention that uh, for some of you who may not have known uh, Dr. Patrick Mendes before, as I mentioned, he's, a, as, as we sometimes say, a staffer of uh, the State Department. So he's a former diplomat. Among others, he was also uh, uh, part of, he was a commissioner of United States at UNESCO. Uh, he's been also, you know, teaching currently at uh, various places in Taiwan. In fact, he's formally there as Taiwan Fellow you know, of the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Taiwan. Uh, but he's also at the same time uh, a distinguished visiting professor at uh, National Chinchil National Chinchu University there. Uh, and also at the same time works with the Center for Security Studies in Taipei. Uh, so multiple uh, positions he's currently holding and he's uh, constantly traveling and speaking and of course constantly writing uh, all the time. I have no idea how he's able to pack so many things together. Uh, he's also formerly uh, alumni of uh, uh, Ivy class, the best institutions of United States, the Kennedy School of Government in Harvard University and also the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. And so a whole varied experience of uh, elite institutions uh, in terms of his training, uh, a whole uh, uh, varied experience of being part of the policy making and enforcement and also now uh, very, very rigorous and regular commentator on uh, you know, some of the best publications that we see and I, I often benefit by reading lots of his, his articles. Uh, so I think I'm personally, as I said, looking forward to uh, his uh, initial remarks and the follow-up discussion. And as the format for all the participants, uh, you're familiar, we will ask the speaker to make his initial remarks for about 25 minutes or so. We are lenient about it if uh, it takes longer time. But we look forward to the second part of uh, the discussion where each of you, in case you wish to engage the speaker, will have that opportunity to engage the speaker one-to-one. -one. and We'll have each question being answered uh, by the speaker, which therefore we keep uh, you know, fairly one hour plus time for that. Uh, and I will uh, really see that, uh, you know, just like we have had before, we'll have several questions given, especially the topic today. And I'm sure his presentation will also germinate enormous interest in the subject and discussion as we go forward from here. With that, I will request uh, Dr. Patrice, Ma Patrick Mendes to uh, begin his initial presentation by sharing his uh, PowerPoint presentation and then start his presentation from there. Over to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Soran, and uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, important uh, gathering. And also thank you, Mina, for your kindness and friendship that you have uh, during these past few days work, try to put this thing together. Thank you again. And also I noticed several of my good friends are here from uh, uh, Takur, from, uh, I met him at the uh, uh, Peking University when I was teaching at the Yenchi Academy and he's a Indian. Uh, outstanding student, I had the uh, opportunity to get to know him, and there are several other, Vincencio from Indonesia is here, and several many more uh, people I'm not going to recognize one by one. I just wanted to say thank you for coming. Uh, really appreciate it for participating in, in this uh, conversation. First, I would like to talk about uh, uh, what is these two unsinkable aircraft carriers are, little bit later, but before that, I wanted to talk to you to set the stage by looking at the US and China. Unless you understand the past, you cannot understand the present or the future. 
So therefore, to see the future, I wanted to go back to the past. So where this idea is coming from, why the way our leaders behave, the way we behave, current context. So in order to know that one, we wanted to return to our history to understand uh, where they are coming from, why we as uh, whether it is Indian or Chinese or American, any other national, how we look at the world, the, our own biases and influences largely shaped by our own histories. So therefore, I really wanted to go back first to look at uh, how do Americans think about America? How do Chinese think about China? And then how do other countries think about the world? So once we know that one as an academic, uh, then we can have a better understanding of the way things are, what are the forces that guide this uh, the superpower rivalry, what we are witnessing right now. So therefore, I also wanted to focus on the two countries, uh, the country I was born, uh, Sri Lanka, which I left uh, when I was a high school exchange student to America. Then uh, I studied back in Sri Lanka at the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura. That's a premier management school. Then I returned to America on a scholarship on the Humphrey School, uh, Humphrey Fellowship, and then Kennedy School, Kennedy Scholarship. So therefore, uh, I wanted to uh, look at it, uh, how I develop my own thinking by being born into an island that I had, uh, my heart is still there, even though I am everywhere. Uh, and then uh, the country that I am now living in, in Taiwan, where you can see the Taiwan flag uh, behind me, because I am sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the Republic of China, which is Taiwan. So I look at this, the, the two countries I, I spend many time uh, back in the US uh, and also teaching in China, uh, or, uh, 27 Chinese universities and most recently at the Peking University uh, uh, in uh, Beijing. So then I'm now born in Sri Lanka and uh, living in Taiwan and uh, I kind of uh, try to learn their own histories in order to formulate my own thinking uh, about what things are moving uh, the undercurrents uh, of this uh, geopolitical competition that we are witnessing now. So in order, to, for the, uh, in order to know that one, I always wanted to go to the history. History of China and history of uh, US and then the current situation. That's what I'm going to talk to you by setting the stage and then uh, looking at the current situation and then we can have a discussion at the very end. So this is divided into three segments. One is the history, and then the current situation, and then we are going to discussion about the future. So in order to do that, let me go to the US history started. America is founded by the, as an experiment. First, the pilgrims came to America from Europe, and then uh, first actually colonists came, and then the pilgrims came. And this conversation uh, influenced the, our great two founding fathers. One is Alexander Hamilton on the left, and the uh, right is Thomas Jefferson. Those two individuals were influenced by colonist uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton, the father of the, uh, our economic system and the federal system. And also he is the uh, first secretary of this uh, uh, treasury. So he is largely influenced by the colonist and you can call him uh, Mr. Wall Street. On the other hand, we have a pilgrims who came to Boston and uh, Plymouth, and then uh, they are looking for religious freedom. And then uh, Thomas Jefferson was pretty much galvanized by and admired uh, their plight for their future in this uh, new country or the promised land. So he was pretty much influenced by the religious freedom. Now you can see the his University, University of Virginia, and then his declaration of religious freedom. And he is the founding uh, of this the champion of the human rights uh, in modern day, what we are talking about. So therefore, these two founding fathers ideas, one is driven by the money side of the America's uh, economy. Other one is the human rights, that's uh, Thomas Jefferson. All these ideas come together when they talk about in the Federalist Papers, and all these two rivalries come now to form what we call the United States of America. 
What we right now seeing is the, when you're looking at the uh, President Donald Trump, he's pretty much like uh, Alexander Hamilton, Hamiltonian. Only thing about he think about is the economy, economy, and economy. When you look at it, uh, Thomas Jefferson, he is wanted to have a religious freedom and econom uh, economic and human rights. And you can see this is both are playing out in the American politics today, even in the last night, uh, um, the presidential debate. You can see that this is the two visions of America is already founded on the founding fathers of America is still continuing. And this is struggle is what is we call the experiment. So that's the experiment coming from the experience of uh, pilgrims and the colonists who came to America. So these two things, even though they are very different, Hamiltonian ideas and Jeffersonian ideas all agreed on one thing. One thing is uh, we can bring people together through trade, not by the religion, race, or the language, but by the trade we can bring people together. So trade makes peace. So this is idea was uh, in the constitution when about the most important words in the U.S. Constitution, which I think is a commerce clause, which it says is uh, regulates commerce with foreign nation and the among several states and the Indian tribes, the Native Americans. So foreign nation, the Constitution, commerce is coming to now call the World Trade Organization. And the several states, now 13 states become 15 states, and now then the Native Americans uh, who are in the reservation mostly. And those three pillars, people, group of communities are working together through, brings them together through trade. For a nation, several states, and also the Native Indians uh, whose land that Americans are living on. So this means, uh, Hamiltonian means the also the Jeffersonian end. So therefore, this is a true trade. People come together, and then we can accomplish the Hamilton, uh, Jeffersonian ends, which is the freedom and liberty and so forth. So therefore, what we are seeing is the, what uh, America wanted to create an empire of liberty, which is coming from the Jeffersonian side of the American thinking. So then, uh, Jeffersonian ideas are still taking place in U.S. foreign policy, whether they are fighting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, they were talking about we want to have a democratic promotion and so forth. These are the Jeffersonian ideas. But where this is coming from, when the country was uh, founded, they wanted to find a country who they can find the inspiration, but they did not go to the Great Britain. They did not like the colonialism and the colonial ideas of the Europe. They turned to China to look for the inspiration. They look for the inspiration by looking at the Chinese culture. Then uh, American, one of the founding fathers, he's the wisest and old, is Benjamin Franklin. He said the Chinese culture, Chinese people are regarded as a highly civilized nation. They wanted to create America in the image of China. He talked about the ideas and in order to have a Confucian proposed the moral governance that's the model that we wanted to have uh, American uh, Empire of Liberty they are envisioning in other words you can see the founding fathers wanted to have a more governance which is kind of lacking in today's in America because of the one person so Another founding father is a Charles, Thomas, uh, Charles Thompson, who is considered to be the uh, prime minister of the Continental Congress. He said uh, Philadelphia, which was the capital at that time, and also the Peking or Beijing is on the same, same latitude. Therefore, we can have the arts and industries and agriculture and husbandry, everything, just like the Chinese. So therefore, we can create the America similar to the uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, civilization. So they are finding another country to model after the new republic which they created. So then uh, another founding father, Thomas Paine, in Common Sense, who is a very famous uh, uh, author at that time and a revolutionary, and he said Chinese people are mild manners and good morals. So they wanted to create a new republic with the mild manners and good morals. 
if you don't have those things, we cannot have uh, America there envisioning to build, which we also saw last night in a presidential debate. When you don't have a mild manners and good morals, we cannot see the America that founding fathers envisioned themselves. So therefore, Benjamin Franklin said, America would in time become process much likeness in the wealth and its industries to China. This is a direct quote from uh, Benjamin Franklin. So in essence, what he is looking for is the Chinese history civilization is the model for the America's future. The past is the prologue for him. So in order to get there, they wanted to create an uh, uh, empire, empire of liberty, which is also different from the imperial China, that's all the dynasties from one to another, but a new country that we wanted to give the liberty or the freedom to the people. But what we are going to do it through the purpose of commerce, we need to, to go to the westward. So Thomas Jefferson, when he was the third president, president, he went to about the land, Louisiana Purchase and so forth. So therefore, America went to the westward. Westward, going westward is called the Manifest Destiny. And uh, all the 13 colonies, the people going westward, in that journey, many things, terrible things happen. You know, the massacres and fighting, and we also all the way went to the Philippines, overtaking over the Hawaii and the so forth. Is westward journey is uh, uh, another part of the America's uh, violent history. So then uh, much of the late uh, uh, mid-1800, uh, 1800, when uh, Abraham Lincoln was the president, and they developed uh, going westward through the railroads, from starting from Chicago and to the uh, Kansas City, all the way to uh, Los Angeles. And then the, there is a northern route, northern route going from the state. I spend most of my time in Minnesota, from Duluth, and then all the way to Seattle. That the northern route, look at their symbol at the very bottom. It is the Chinese symbol, Jing Yang. So in essence, these railroads are largely built by the Chinese labor. So what you see is that they, America wanted to build the railroad civilization. So therefore, this founding vision and the commercial vision is what we talk about, the commerce with all nations, alliance with none. peace and friendship and commerce, which should be our model. model. And, it, and Thomas Jefferson said, trade with all, entangle with none. So this is the America's vision at that time. It is the enlightened vision that most of us forgotten about, especially the, our leaders forgotten about where we come from. And that created the problem to not only the America, but also to the world. So what we said is another founding father who is the son of the John Adams, John Quincy Adams is an illustrious American. He was not only the secretary of his state, and, but he also the, um, the, became the president. He said America should not go abroad in search, to, uh, in search of monsters to uh, destroy. He should be the well wishers of the freedom and uh, champion of uh, our own things so other people can emulate America by looking at their behavior. So therefore, these are the founding vision and non inventionist foreign policy that America had at the very beginning of the is a Republican experience. So in order to get there, America first time in 1784 sent our first commercial on George Washington's birthday, our founding father's birthday, uh, the first president of the birthday. It's called the Emperors of China. For so there, rather than sending to the Europe, they sent this ship to China merely because we wanted to trade with China. We wanted to have a emulate Chinese civilization and the commercial civilization and the two countries together. So that has the idea at the founding fathers had, and is still continuing to be this the case because this the two largest economy are now intricately connected to do each other by trade. So then uh, 
the trade missions all stopped when the opium war started uh, in 1800. 18, there are two opium wars led by the British, uh, British not only the colonized here, but they also, the British went to the um, uh, uh, China, and then they had these two opium wars. And then uh, America during the same century uh, experienced the American Civil War during the President Abraham Lincoln time, and then also the Taiping Civil War or Taiping Rebellion took place in China. What we know is about over seven, uh, 700,000 American died civil war, but in China, millions died during the uh, Taiping Rebellion. So then uh, early part of the last century, then we experienced two world war, major two world wars, one and the two. And out of that one, then the Republic of China was born. Republic of China under Dr. Sun Yat-sen started in 1912 because the end of the Qing dynasty and that all the imperial China collapsed and the new China is called the Republic of China. And then uh, uh, during the civil war, during the 1912 to 1949, the Republic of China moved, uh, retreat from the mainland China, then end up in uh, Taiwan. So Taiwan is now called the Republic of China. And it happened when uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek was the president at that time, they all moved to Taiwan because of the communists led by the chairman uh, Mao Zedong took over the mainland China. Now, mainland China is called the Republic, uh, People's Republic of China, PRC. The capital is being the Beijing and Taiwan is Taipei is the capital where I am speaking from. So therefore this is a history is very important now because of the Republic of China. Now the Taiwan is a very vibrant uh, democracy and you also known about the China uh, Taiwan model as the very effective way of uh, dealing with coronavirus and it has been uh, heralded as the example for other countries to emulate, not only the, because the democracy and their belief in science and they have a transparency and economy is uh, vibrant. At the same time, the Repu People's Republic of China, Communist China, which is very opposing to the Taiwan, is pretty much uh, there is no transparency and they hide the coronavirus or Wuhan virus, which uh, sometime initially called COVID-19. So therefore, there are two different systems emerge from this the Republic of China, and then they broke away to uh, came to Taiwan to as a refuge, and this political struggle is still continuing to today, which I'm going to, to focus on in uh, pretty soon. Let me finish up this as a background before you, I got, get there. So first is the, this two republic. This one is concentrating on order and stability is the P, uh, CPC, uh, Communist Party of China in mainland. Other part is the, like the US and even Taiwan, they are focusing on the liberty, freedom and democracy and so forth. Now is the question come is the, whether you want to have a stable uh, controlled society or the freedom or the liberty to their people. So that kind of evolution coming into be called what I call the Chinese experiment. First, we have a Confucian culture, which is still there. And then the, we have a nationalist republic 1912 that is started by Sun Yat Sen, and then uh, that broke away uh, into the, the Cultural Revolution and everything that happened between 1949 to until the end of Chairman Mao Zedong's death in 1776. And then uh, Deng Xiaoping came in. Deng Xiaoping opened up the economy, which is essentially I think Deng Xiaoping is uh, Alexander Hamilton of China wanted to have an economic driving power for their economic development. He led the export-led uh, export development and trade liberalization. That makes China a very economically powerful country in the world. And then there comes uh, President Xi Jinping, pretty much using the economic liberalization, but they doesn't want to have that uh, freedom and liberty is much, much in the control. So, as opposed to the Chinese experience, the America has our own experience. 
because we started with the Hamilton means to Jeffersonian end, because America went through its own journey. At the very first, we didn't have uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, they have, didn't have the freedom that we are enjoying now, and uh, women didn't have rights to vote, and African American didn't have uh, civil rights and the voting rights until Martin Luther King came in. So this is not a republic, uh, it's not a democracy at the very beginning. They fought for it. Uh, this is their freedom and the founding fathers envision in this uh, enlightened republic to be someday. So Hamiltonian means they come from the Jeffersonian struggle with the uh, freedom for women suffrage and the civil rights. And what we are experiencing today is the riots and everything going on in the US. It's a Jeffersonian struggle working against the Hamiltonian ideas of economy first, economy first, and then the COVID-19 second. So this struggle is, is still going on, which I call the American experience. So this, given this background, now China under President Xi Jinping wanted to rejuvenate his culture and its nation, which he called the China dream. And he started from the, the Western going westward through the from Xi'an, the ancient capital of China, and all the way to the Europe. And that was, the, it started from the Hang dynasty, and it became a very powerful, very powerful part uh, uh, with the Silk Road during the Tang dynasty. So this is the one part of that uh, uh, President Xi Jinping wanted to consider is the uh, uh, China dream part, uh, uh, one element of this uh, China dream. The second part is coming from the Ming Dynasty, which is the Admiral Ming Chu, also went to southwards uh, seven times. And in fact, he came to Sri Lanka several times and he climbed the uh, mountains there and he spent times there. And actually there was a war during the, that called the Ming Kote War that uh, uh, led to the kidnapping of the Sri Lankan king and take to the Nanjing. It's a different story, matter of fact. So he also visited uh, India several times. So Indian Ocean for them is the Admiral Cheng is called the Western Ocean. So if China were to, to take over South China Sea and it comes to the Indian Ocean, pretty soon in my vision, there is no Indian Ocean is going to be a Western Ocean. So this is a part of the, the strategy, which I think is China is pursuing, taking over East China Sea to the South China Sea, build the artificial island, and then, then coming into Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is uh, centrally located in the Indian Ocean, and it has the Buddhist connection to China, and it become an uh, ideal situation for China's ambitions for national rejuvenation, which I come to talk to you a little bit later. So this one, this uh, revival of the, uh, this uh, northern route and the southern maritime route is through the, uh, largely by the merchant and then the monks came. Monks came in like the Fahian and Swansen. Swansen he spent many years in, is, uh, in India and also Fahian or Fahian. Uh, he spent time in Sri Lanka 411 to 413 uh, uh, AD. So this is going to the westward in the route. The, the two is to rejuvenation of the Chinese culture. But that means that China is still thinking about, uh, at least the President Xi Jinping thinks about, uh, it is still the Middle Kingdom, and he wants to revive that the Chinese idea of the celestial empire. So celestial empire is going to the, all the borders of China, and it created a problem with the Indian borders, or, uh, or the, with the uh, Bhutan, or in the Vietnam, or in the northern side in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and so forth, and so on. So which we come to that one a little bit later, this is celestial empire. So now you can see the empire of liberty that America wanted to create, and then you have another idea, is celestial empire, that uh, imperial China is controlling the world. So these two ideas philosophically and in practice what we are seeing today. 
So now this is a one belt, one road initiative of BRI, which we consider is the, their strategy to, to get to what they want to get. Yeah. The one is the silk economic uh, belt, which is a northern route, and the southern route is the maritime silk road, which they call the road, even though it is uh, not really a road, it's a navigational system. So whatever it means, this is the two strategy. One is the northern route is a model after the Tang dynasty, and the southern one is the Ming dynasty. These are, they consider, are the, they belong to the Hung nationals. So, which is the, about 94% of the populations are Han. And actually, I don't believe they are Han. They are because of the, the Yuan dynasty and the Qing dynasty. There are interracial marriages and other things happen. There is no any Han or they are, you know, pure blooded Han. It's just like Hitler said, I am an Aryan. He doesn't even have Aryan blood. He's pretty much a Jew. So because of the nationalistic motives, they wanted to galvanize people. Hitler used the similar kind of things. So each country, they wanted to consider their national or political reason they galvanized. Even in India, they have a nationalistic motive, and Sri Lanka, and even America right now. So these are political motives, but in a, scientifically, you cannot find the DNA of purely everybody. We are all mixed up. We are at the very end of the day, we are all mixed up. So in essence, what we have is the one vision. We wanted to have a commercial civilization, whether it is the Chinese or the American. But we are going to get at it is the two mission. Two missions are playing out in Sri Lanka and in Taiwan, which we are going to talk about soon. Before that, let me talk about what is the two missions. One is advocated now, very clearly seen by the President Xi Jinping. On the other mission is that now they wanted to decouple the economy from the China. And then we wanted to create a, another, what we call the huge fractured world between one is pro-Chinese, another one is pro-American. This is a two mission for the one same vision, which is the co creating a commercial civilization. So that idea, which we know is already recognized at the very beginning of the PRC in 1949. Few years later that we have a North Korean, uh, Korean War, which we involved with uh, when the China uh, People's Republic was created. At that time, even the CIA 1965 said uh, in national uh, intelligence estimate, this is the communist China. Major thing is, they want to get rid of the American power in the Pacific. Pacific mean in the South Korea, Japan, and the Taiwan, and the Philippines, and the uh, Indonesia, and the, all the Pacific Rim countries. So that has not changed over the years, the way American intelligence community think about what China wants to do. China wants to do is to get rid of the American influence. This is the empire of liberty. We need to, to get rid of the empire liberty. We want to create a celestial empire in our neighborhood. That is the, one of the underlying thinking about uh, American uh, intelligent community. And then uh, most recently, they said China's main objective, Communist Party of China's main objective is to maintain the power ensuring the domestic key stability and protecting their own sovereignty and territorial claims and depending China's uh, integrity mostly. Therefore, they wanted to have uh, resolve all the problem, whether it's uh, Galwan uh, or it's in the near Bhutan or Arunachal Pradesh, that the border issues we have, uh, territorial integrity. So these frictions are now taking plain out, which we, America, recognize it uh, even in the 1960s. That has not changed. It is, there is no change the way America look at it. But the policies have changed from Bill Clinton to Barack Obama, uh, uh, the George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and then uh, President Donald Trump took the drastic action by recognizing this is what China actually have. America has woken up. It's just like Napoleon Bonaparte said, let China sleep. When it wakes, it will uh, uh, shake on the world. So this is the wakening up call which 
Trump administration has done by recognizing what the China's intentions are for the world. So this has been no major changes in the U.S. When you look at it to the now, there is a containment policy, is a spread of communism is America's idea because America wanted to create the empire of liberty. China wants to have a celestial empire. So that has not changed in the U.S. administration fundamentally. So now the Trump administration come on, then they said, wait a minute, this is what China is doing. China is going to the Indian borders and others and the Tibetan issues and the Uyghurs and the, even to the Hong Kong. They are solidifying their territorial integrity. This is the expansion of the Chinese idea of the celestial empire. So now this ideas are beginning to resonate with the policymakers in the US, even though I've been writing about this one for a while. So now the Belt and Road Initiative is the ends and the ways and means to get there. Now they use the BRI, is a national rejuvenation or the revival model after Tang and Ming dynasties. What is the end game? End game is, that the Republic of China that retreated from the mainland China came to Taiwan. Recapturing and reunification is their end game. In order to get there, what they are going to do, they do all these things to the BRI. BRI is the strategy. It is not the end game, but it is strategy to get to Taiwan. So one is they went to the East China Sea, is Senkaku Island, and then the South China Sea in their Paracel Island, and so forth, uh, and claiming them, and then went to, to Sri Lanka and got Sri Lanka pretty much on their hand. And Sri Lanka cannot do anything unless they get the permission from Beijing. So this is the reality of the geopolitics right now. Even now, Sri Lanka has economic problems, and in the earlier this year, China gave 500, uh, for 500 million dollars because they cannot get anywhere else. So China is happy to give this one because it is China, Sri Lanka is part of China, why should I, they bother? So 99 years, they have a Hambantu port, so China, Sri Lanka is going to behave the, what China is going to tell them. So therefore, these are the means to get to the end game. So now, because of the coronavirus came, now they produce this uh, uh, digital Silk Road, which you can see that the Sri Lanka is building that uh, Tower, the Lotus Tower is the highly sophisticated communication tower, which they initially claim for the navigational purposes, uh, which we need to see whether they are going to, to keep their word, just like the South China Islands, they said they are peaceful and we are not going to militarize them, which they did, and we have to see what would happen to the Sri Lanka eventually comes into be. And then the, after the coronavirus, that digital Silk Road was, uh, became a health Silk Road and send in the protective gears and medicine and other things to other countries. So therefore, China has a remarkable ability to, to adapt and change. So that is the one thing it is remarkable of that leadership. So now this come in, recognizing all these things, US government passed the new act called the Taipei Act. Because in the past, Taiwan is uh, diplomatically isolated. They only have 15 countries, uh, small countries in, uh, in the Pacific and the Caribbean and the Central America. So largest one, most important one is the Vatican, the Holy See. These are the 13 countries that recognize a uh, diplomatic relation with Taiwan. China want to get rid of all these things and they are gradually doing a very successful effort by the power of their pocket. So now isolating Taiwan is not an uh, option for uh, the US because US now recognizes this is the vibrant economy, highly advanced. What I call it, the Taiwan is a Switzerland or the uh, Jewish state here, uh, the Israel is uh, very highly advanced in technology and both in uh, uh, communication technology and biotechnology, even in the, their higher education system is much very advanced. And the students are, are highly, highly sophisticated, the student group I ever met here. So therefore, 
America wants to, to keep this vibrant island uh, in a democratic side or the liberty and freedom on the side. They don't want to gobble up into the Chinese side. They, they, uh, they, um, they have done it onto Sri Lanka and other countries as well. So therefore, America passed this the Taipei Act, which essentially saying to the other countries, you cannot diplomatically isolate it, uh, Taiwan. You need to, to work with them. Okay, so this effort and also the two high level US officials came into Taiwan recently, and it is a part of the new act, Taiwan uh, Tra Travel Act, that gives them more access. Uh, because initially, 1979, President Jimmy Carter recognized uh, mainland China PRC as a one China policy. So that one at that time, then Sri uh, uh, the U.S. has this uh, policy of ambiguity. Now we are moving away from that uh, policy of ambiguity more to the clarity of uh, U.S. policy to recognize work with uh, Taiwan because uh, America needs to uphold to that uh, American ideals of Jeffersonian to bring the Jeffersonian into the region. So therefore, the ends we now recognize what need to be done. So therefore, now they all, not only the Maritime Act, they also have an Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, uh, IPS, as to bring in the, pretty much the maritime security into the region, not only the uh, Pacific, but they recognize the danger that posed to the Indian Ocean because of Sri Lanka. So this issue now is in the because of that, the high-level official came in very recently, and China sending uh, their aircraft uh, carriers in the Taiwan Strait, and also to the meridian line between that uh, China and uh, Taiwan. So that's also itself the violation, but it is uh, Taiwan can do this, uh, China can do this one because uh, they have the ability to do it and technologically advance their, they have uh, capabilities now than before. And the U.S. also trying to protect uh, Taiwan, sending their aircraft carriers. So these aircraft carriers are not, the idea is not new, but uh, essentially these ideas came into General De Douglas MacArthur when he wrote the memorandum of, uh, uh, on Formosa. Formo Formosa is the old name for Taiwan, just like uh, Ceylon is to Sri Lanka. So Taiwan and Formosa and Ceylon and Sri Lanka, for example. So therefore, this is the MacArthur, uh, Douglas MacArthur, one is the, who invented this idea, the, the term called the unsinkable aircraft carriers. These are islands, then you don't need to have aircraft carriers moving on the ocean, but you have uh, unsinkable one in Taiwan. Now there is another one in Sri Lanka in the Indian Ocean. So that is why these two islands are, strategically located two region are critically important to the US strategy and Taiwan, China's strategy for their own influence of this hemisphere. So China has now two aircraft carriers, Lianin, which they got it in Ukraine, the former Soviet Republic, and they modernize it. And then now they have their own uh, uh, aircraft carrier called Sandong. Sandong is a very purposeful name the, because it's the, Sandong is the, uh, the province uh, which I actually taught there at the University of Sandong and Qingdao and Jinan. But uh, Sandong is also critically important to China's history and pride because it's the cradle of Chinese civilization both uh, uh, Confucius and Mensuers and all the leading uh, intellectual came from the, that province, Sandong province. So what is important is uh, during the war time, during the first from the Germany and then to the Japan, that Shandong was colonized. Now, after the World War I, they did not give back the Taiwan, uh, Shandong province back to China. So that led to the first betrayal during the Versailles Treaty, the, the uh, Paris uh, Peace Conference after the World War I. So that 
betrayal is well remembered by the Chinese people and the Chinese leaders. Shandong is the cradle of uh, Shandong province is a cradle of uh, civil, their own civilization, but colonized by Germans and then the Japanese. So now they have to send a quoted message to the world. Wait a minute, we are going to send our aircraft carriers, which is Shandong. Sandong has a history, it has a meaning, it has a coded meaning to you. Those who know it, know it. Those who don't, it's just Sandong. So there is why I think is the history is very important. Unless you know this meaning, you don't have the really understanding of what China is doing and why they are doing the, the way they're doing it. So now come to the other unsinkable aircraft carrier is in Indian Ocean. Which, which eventually, I think, if the China become uh, that influence in the years to come, there is no Indian notion. I'm sad to say my Indian friend or the Indonesian friends, um, that's going to be uh, China's Western Ocean because that's what the Admiral Ching He talked about uh, in his tra travelogue. So therefore, now you can have uh, two unsinkable aircraft carriers to these uh, two strategies. So one is uh, Sri Lanka. Why is it Sri Lanka important? Taiwan is uh, pretty much the same population, and Sri Lanka is the twice the size of Taiwan. But uh, they are very famous for uh, tea plantations. Uh, uh, we have a tea from uh, Sri Lanka, uh, like Norelia and uh, high mountain teas. And also we have a wonderful uh, Ch Ch Taiwan's green tea from Alisan and so forth. I had the privilege to travel around all the provinces of uh, all the uh, districts of Taiwan uh, during my stay. I've been coming in and off last 10 years to Taiwan. This is the longest time I stayed in Taiwan, but on my home country, I traveled to all the places and studied, and also Sri Lanka has a remarkable history from the, my hometown of Polonarua. And therefore, these two countries are very important because it is to main location of the Indian Ocean and is the connecting the both Asia and Europe through the Sri Lanka uh, as a hub for that one. That is why Hamban Thota and Colombo Port City are critically important to China because it is the stopping transshipment place for Chinese goods all the way to Europe and to Africa. And India is also have interested in Trincomalee, which we can talk about a little bit later. And the US also are very interested in, the, they wanted to have a SOFA agreement uh, renewal, which they signed in the past, and ability for military aircraft, the military, uh, American military to arrive in Sri Lanka. And uh, you probably know we can talk about that uh, effort that the US is trying to do with the Indian government and uh, sign uh, uh, with the India. And matter of fact, uh, by the side note, I want to let you know is I work on the India-US uh, uh, civil nuclear agreement when I was working in the George W. administration at the U.S. State Department. So I have written on the India-U.S. Uh, nuclear uh, civil nuclear agreement. If you are interested in, you can Google it. So I can understand now India is moving that direction because of the recent violence in Galwan in the Panju um, in the in the border of uh, uh, Jambu Kashmir area and the corner of uh, Pakistan. So then uh, there is another one, Millennium Challenge Corporation or MCC Pact is trying to push by the US to, to sign, which is connecting the Colombo and the Trincomalee in that corridor between Southwest to the Northeast corner of Sri Lanka. And uh, that one is a $480 million project. And uh, that one very critical and controversial in Sri Lanka, which is interesting to see how Sri Lankan politics is working out. Sri Lanka can give the China uh, access to the Sri Lanka for 99 years, which is pretty much uh, just like the British got the Hong Kong for 99 years. So China pretty much has now is spending another 1.4 billion in the Colombo port city. Once they have that, con they have controlled the country. And now they have the US trying to push the balance in the power by through the MCC. So interesting part is the Sri Lankans are not really aware of uh, this geopolitical struggle going on with the China. It is because uh, China is very brilliant in their strategy. They use the Buddhist diplomacy. 
Buddhist diplomacy in the sense that uh, now they have a uh, uh, Buddhist tower, which I is called the uh, Lotus uh, Lotus Tower and the Lotus uh, another um, the 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 uh, Lotus also they have a theater and also now they have Hamban theater. It's pretty much uh, Sri Lanka is uh, under the Chinese influence. It is uh, undying fact. So now the when the U.S. come in in this one, this is very become very critical. Hey, we are going to, to give the China in American influence, but the essence is. It's not American influence. It is already uh, it's a Chinese tributary system is already in work in, in Sri Lanka. I was talking to senior military officers the other day uh, and also some senior government people. Uh, they said, we cannot do anything about it. We have to ask Chinese and they will make a phone call uh, if you are trying to have uh, a, anything with the Taiwan or doing other things. It's just like uh, similar to my Indian audience too. It's just like Bhutan cannot do anything unless Bhutan has the blessing of the New Delhi. It is not written, but it is given. So now you can see in your backyard, you have uh, another little China that India has to a little bit concern about. And uh, India has to concern about uh, Chinese nationalism in Bangladesh and also in, uh, um, in, uh, in Nepal. And uh, Bhutan very come to come to very close. And now also on the Western side of uh, Pakistan. So this is a Chinese strategy is working. So this is awareness of is not there yet. I think this yet to come. So Sri Lanka, they think it is another interesting thing because the US wanted to move that to an, uh, their military base from Diego Garcia to much closer to the the to the continent to the. Um, Indian, uh, India, Indian and subcontinent, which we talk about that one, another element to this uh, geostrategical struggle that is taking place. So now, why is it Sri Lanka? Because Sri Lanka has a long history. The Farsian came in the fourth century and he went to the, our first capital, which is Andhradapura, and he spent time in Abegiria Dagaba. He translated and took some books back to Chindavo and back to Lian, uh, 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 to China. Yeah, so essentially, now you, this is the, the, the Ming Dynasty came and they put the, this is the, uh, called the uh, Gold Triangle, which is essentially say is in the Ming Dynasty, the peaceful world built on trade. That's also solidify my, what I said is the very beginning, China wanted to create the commercial civilization. It was this peaceful travel explained to us. So then uh, what is happening right now, we have Hamban Tota and Colombo Lotus Tower and the Colombo Port. 2014, when President Xi visited Sri Lanka, then uh, two submarines came along with it and sent in a message to India. Then it was, it was noted by the Indian and they have a little agitation in New Delhi. Afterward, nothing pretty much happened because uh, India has the noise. It's what I call the meaningless noise, China has a meaningful action. So that's the difference. So now, why Taiwan? Because it's the corridor to move the US away from the first uh, line of defense to the second one. Second one is the based on Guam, where which we have a military base. It is the American territory. So this is the another reason that the US wanted to get rid of the US from the uh, the Western Pacific, and the U.S. now exercising its uh, power through the legal uh, Taipei Act and under the freedom of navigation. So now the question is, this the East China Sea and South China Sea, especially South China Sea, they are pretty much the artificial islands were built, and the East China Sea, they are a uh, keen identification, uh, air identification zone, which is pretty much control the air traffic coming into China. They said they are AI space. They are pretty much essentially sending the message to the world. They are in charge and control in that region. So now when the President Xi Jinping came into power, you can see the side right, the slide and the jamming and uh, instruction has increased in addition to the Russians are doing their all interests in the region as well. 
So now the Indian Ocean is moving from Indian Ocean to Sri Lanka is a much more strategic move because 1936, uh, 2036, the Diogo Garcia have to return to the British or to the Diogo Garcian. And uh, now they, then the US need to find another place to uh, return to their military base, uh, which is uh, Sri Lanka. Or the, now you can see the Maldives Islands just signed the agreement with the US to have uh, Maldives as the uh, defense uh, agreement with the US for that purposes. And then uh, this struggle is intensifying, as you have seen, this is uh, Maldives US uh, agreement which they signed a few days ago. So now the question is for rest of the countries in the world is the entanglement with, between we are some are entangled with the BRI, another one is the Indo Pacific region. So where does it uh, from Sri Lanka to Taiwan to any other countries? Where should we go? Singaporean Prime Minister said, please don't force us to choose because we need China, because their investment, they are economically powerful, and we need to have a freedom, we need to America, because we believe in America. So now the question is, the US security guarantees freedom of navigation, or the China's integration, or the connectivity, or, or your choice for the small countries, or the other countries, is a new era of combination, or do you want to take a choice? So this is where we are in, and thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, I think sincere apologies for pushing you to close it. No, 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 that's fine. It was going really very interesting and uh, very unique uh, historical perspective of the US-China engagement over centuries uh, evolving uh, in a very interesting fashion. Uh, how United States wanted to, in some sense, emulate uh, both uh, the, the civilization and the prosperity, uh, and how the trade became the instrument to build that peaceful relationship. I'm aware that uh, several of you have several questions. Many of you have uh, also put some things in the box. But let me first acknowledge uh, presence here amongst us uh, of Manjeet Kripalani, a, a friend. Uh, also, uh, I'm sure most of you know her. Uh, she's the, among several other things, co-founder of a very famous uh, Gateway House uh, uh, think tank in uh, Mumbai. Uh, she's also currently the director there. Uh, but I uh, want to bring also to notice, so she allows me to say that, that she could perhaps bring the other voice in United States political divide. Uh, <laughs> amongst us here. Uh, we, in United States, most people are very committed in terms of their politics uh, because basically there are fundamentally two political parties unlike India where you have maybe up to 700 political parties. Uh, so I wish to acknowledge her presence here. I also wish to acknowledge the presence of uh, Syed Rahman uh, who is a Pakistani scholar, a very regular participant and in our, who is currently in Taipei. He's a professor based in Taipei right now, so we could have another person uh, view of the reality, uh, how we see these two islands being engaged by both China and United States. Uh, both of uh, fundamentally expanding their footprint, uh, realizing their visions, uh, but how interestingly United States is increasingly using uh, the military instrument, uh, the defense agreements uh, with Sri Lanka, the Taipei Act, uh, for example, as uh, uh, Patrick mentioned, Taiwan Allies International Protection and Enhancement Initiative, which is an abbreviation for Taipei. Uh, and of course, lately, very interesting uh, view of how United States has started sending senior level serving officials to visit Taiwan, resulting in uh, Chinese uh, aircraft simply breaching airspace, uh, facing other path projections. Uh, so in that sense, the uh, server rattling as if uh, is much more visible in case of Taiwan, but I'm happy that Patrick also built up a kind of a template which applies uh, to Sri Lanka, where uh, this kind of uh, jostling for influence is uh, relatively subtle 
uh, as of now, but could potentially become as rigorous as uh, in case of Taiwan. And how will that impact uh, other nations? Uh, for example, India, he did bring in India repeatedly. Uh, to begin with, maybe I could invite uh, Manjeet to maybe like to say something on the presentation made so far. Um, <clears throat> surely, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. I enjoyed listening to it and the, the very, the very topic is so evocative to call Sri Lanka and Taiwan the unsinkable aircraft carriers of the US. Uh, Professor Mendes, you're absolutely right. President has, has, uh, has created the churn uh, that, has, that, has shown, that, has, that, that has shown China's hand to the world. Do you think with the election going on uh, just now, do you think that the big concern is that should he not come back to power, Will the U.S. go back to being the partner with China or rather with being the partner with China? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, if I may, may I say, Manjit? Yes. Um, uh, you can call me Patrick. Uh, I, I'm Patrick. from Midwest, from Minnesota. Everybody is egalitarian world yes. that we are living yes. in. Uh, and also I have a Buddhist background from back born and raised in Sri Lanka. So just call me Patrick. Sure. Uh, uh, Manjit, this is... Uh, uh, I was listening to the, the presidential election. You can mm -hmm. see the uh, in my head, uh, I was thinking about now Jefferson and Hamiltonian ideas going on. And uh, one is a uh, little bit uh, uh, kind of, to me, un-American. I never met uh, American behaving like that one. But uh, even in Minnesota, after watching movie Pago, so we don't uh, talk and walk like that majority of Americans because uh, many of the Americans are more decent, more civilized uh, in manner, their presentation. So uh, given all these things, question is, the, will the next administration uh, uh, continue these policies? Uh, I think there is uh, no U-turn. Uh, the reason what I'm saying is this one is, uh, now the world comes to realize what Chinese intentions are. When President Xi Jinping, when he went to the White House and told Barack Obama, well, we are not going to militarize this is, uh, uh, islands in the South China Sea. While he was talking, they are still militarizing South China Sea. They are not beginning to believe that one. So all the American policymakers thought in the mindset, America, uh, China after Deng Xiaoping's, the, their Hamilton is economy is going to work up uh, and is going to be democratic someday. It never happened. I don't think it will happen because the China, they need to understand. I spent the China going back and forth the last 20 plus years. So I understand the mindset. It is the mindset uh, uh, that pretty much now understood, not by the administration, but, but the US Congress. Largely by the US Congress is unanimous in their thinking what China is up to. Okay, so we do have a credibility issue in the current administration. Nobody wants to, to trust uh, current administration, Trump administration, because he himself changes ideas in one sentence. Uh, and uh, this is uh, troublesome and we don't know what to believe. And he changed one thing and uh, whatever uh, one of my friends told me, uh, if you want to know president is lying, just, Watch his mouth. Every time he opened his line. So that's created a credibility issue in the world right now. But but he has done something right, let's say his advisors. They brought forward to the what China is actually doing uh, in around the world and what they are trying to do. This is the uh, island of democracy, which I call the heart of Asia. So question is now the American public and the US Congress and the world around it really understand what the China's intention are. Therefore, I do not think there is a U-turn. But again, remember, we have the same tradition of that Hamiltonian tradition of economic development uh, and uh, trade with other countries and entangled with none. That street is still there. 
pretty much I think there is a way that America will find to trade with China, but at the same time, they are going to, to, to talk about the Jeffersonian ends, putting the pressure on to talk about uh, Tibetan issue, the Uyghur issue, and the human right issue, and then and the Hong Kong issue, and so forth, and the border issues. So I think they are also going to, to be more active. They are going to speak like Jefferson. President Donald Trump probably knows about it, uh, Hamilton. I don't know whether he knows about American history, but he knows about Hamilton. At least he should, because he's from New York also. But I do not think he knows about how to spell Jefferson, because he never talked about the Jeffersonian idea when a lot of people in Xinjiang and Hong Kong issues are challenged by the Taiwan, China. So he did not activate, he did not speak like Jefferson around the world. That's what is the lack in this American experience to work. We need to, to talk about the trade on the one side. We need to, to speak like Jefferson's on the other side. Otherwise, our human experiment does not work. Or the American experiment does not work. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, the next uh, two make intervention is Dominique, because it's already past midnight for her, so <laughs> I ask her to make her intervention. Yes. <laughs> thank you. First, I just wanted to thank you for the very informative talk and invitation to join. Um, I had a question about the recent June China-India border dispute resulting in casualties on both sides, and then the recent flare-up in September with shots fired along the border. Um, how has that border dispute affected China's relationship with Sri Lanka and other Southeast Asian countries or changed the relationship between China and other Southeast Asian countries in your perspective? And what should the U.S. response to that be? Excellent, excellent question, uh, Dominic. And I want to let my colleagues know Dominic uh, is a colleague and friend and we co-authored several articles. He's a very gifted writer and uh, her own rights. Uh, so democracy, they told us so. But the Chinese does not know how many Chinese even killed. Don't you want to know? Do you want to know you are the citizen of that country? So that is the transparency issue, freedom issue, that it is uh, troublesome, even to my Chinese friends. They are asking me the information. So the question is this, China also, I mean, India also has their, its own foreign policy issues. This is uh, my friendly criticism, which I also shared with my colleague when I was in uh, Bangalore at, uh, uh, at the Synergia Foundation with my good colleague and friend, uh, Toby Simon. And uh, uh, I said uh, uh, to some of my colleagues there, even to my Indian friends, India now has the look east policy, which is in response to the, this is the China issue, put the pressure in, coming in, China is, I mean, India is responding to, to look in the East, going to the Southeast Asia, and because it has a long history anyway, going to Indonesia and Southeast Asia because of the Hindu migration and the connections and the Buddhism and all these things are part of there. You know, it is, it is not a criticism, I'm looking for look, in, look East policy. But the, what India forgot is their own neighborhood. What you need is uh, India to have neighbors first, rather than going to uh, Southeast Asia. India to take care of uh, his own brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka, the Maldives and Pakistan, Bangladesh. Well, uh, uh, Pakistan is another issue, but uh, in general, you need to have a good relations with our, uh, their neighbors, which they do have it. But uh, little by little, it is the, the, the power is shifting to the other side because uh, of the China, uh, the India has tend to ignore and um, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, even in Sri Lanka, because uh, after Gandhi's assassination and it involves in the uh, LTT uh, Tamil uh, civil war over there, there, there are a number of reasons they don't want to get burned again and uh, looking east is much better. 
so, but I think uh, India is uh, doing this one is uh, another mistake. It should uh, engage uh, just like India recently did with the Maldive Islands, which is uh, they gave an investment uh, project to the, I think, $500 million. Uh, Reina, you can correct me if I'm wrong, $500 million. So that, that way, and uh, India needs to, to engage with the Sri Lanka. They are our brothers and sisters. You know, I mean, I might have Indian blood somewhere in me, uh, even though I have a Portuguese last name and Christian your name just like uh, people in Goa and uh, Kerala and so forth. So what I'm saying is India needs to, to rethink its foreign policy, look to its uh, neighbors first. And another one is uh, India needs to, to recognize its own people and as their own Indian brothers and sisters, especially the uh, female sector and recognizing them uh, uh, as uh, they are in an equal way and get away from uh, what is uh, this uh, culture dictate and go back to the India secular constitution which they form at the very beginning of the nation. So therefore there are certain things needed to rethink about uh, India to, to be a func I mean, a well-functioning and uh, 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 democracy, which it is. Uh, so having said that one, because of these uh, border issues, not only from the, what we happened with the recent in the Galwan, but also in the near border, uh, Bhutan border in the, a few years ago. And uh, there, now the recent event take another U-turn in the Ch Indian foreign policy. They start to not only to the ban the TikTok and uh, other social media and other apps and so forth. You are amazed to find out how much the Chinese infiltration in China, in, in, uh, in India, until recently, they did not recognize how much uh, the uh, Indian Chinese influence there. That is why I call it uh, India has uh, meaningless noise and China has uh, meaningful action. I'm not blaming that one because I grew up in Sri Lanka and the only, only way to defend against the British colony was to speak, just like Gandhi did. So we tend to, to talk a lot of things, you know, I mean, it's a part of a democracy, we are noisy and messy and so forth. So India now recognize it, now wait a minute, Many Indians are using the TikTok and other Indian uh, the, the, uh, Chinese div, uh, instrument and devices in uh, this is the country is, which is also technologically advanced. If you go to, to Bangalore and so forth, you know I have many friends that are high tech people. Look at it, your CEOs in America, Pepsi Cola to IB to the, all the high tech companies, the Silicon Valley's. They are not American brains, they are Chinese Indian brains. So therefore, why can't we, India itself, develop these uh, resources and tap into this uh, brilliance and become like Chinese? So that is why I say it is the meaningless noise and uh, meaningful action. That's the distinction which I'm making. So going back to this uh, new U-turn that taken by because of the US action and what happened in the Galwan. Uh, the border issue. Now that India recognize we need to, to keep our democracy intact. We cannot have a celestial empire telling us what to do. So if someday Indian Ocean become a Western Ocean, how do you feel like that one? How you feel like your brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka is part of China because of the Buddhist diplomacy. We are connected not because we are brothers and sisters or because we are neighbors, because we are connected because we have the same aspirations to be free. So that is why I made the, my choice to be in a country that I can speak freely without uh, worrying about whether I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning or not. So this is the idea is what bring us together. We cannot have trade unless there is a freedom 
for the freedom of navigation and freedom of his speech. That's what we cherish for. So now the India recognized being in the world's largest democracy and working with the most powerful democracy, whatever their weaknesses are, whether it is now driven by the nationalism, both countries, Hindu nationalism versus America's white nationalism. So whatever they are, the, all the challenges, the experiment is there. We are in the experiment. We are experimenting this human experience. So what I'm thinking is, uh, to answer your question, my friend, uh, is uh, we need to realize what their intentions are. We knew their intentions. As I told you, when the Kennedy administration to the Bush, uh, the Trump administration, we knew their intention. But what we did not know was their capabilities. Now they can match their intention with the capabilities. That reminds me, Napoleon Bonaparte said, let China sleep. When it wakes up, it will shake the world. So this is where we've been sleeping and they are sleeping because they have the intention, but they didn't have the capability. Now they do. They come to your border where there is no hardly people in the Galawan uh, you know, high mountain areas or Arunachalam area, uh, Pradesh in the Northeast. So now we come to understand what is their intention and they have a capabilities to do it. We knew it with the Indian uh, 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 in the 1960s, the war with the India. And it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, that time they won the war and they retreat. And then uh, now they come into near Bhutan and retreat. And this is the way it works. Now they have the capabilities. Now, because of that one, I think uh, the people in a democracy uh, need to realize uh, whether you want to live in an empire of liberty or the celestial empire. You Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Professor Rina Marwa wants to also engage you, make a comment. Of All question. right. All right. I send see Rina. Yes, go ahead, Rina. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patrick Mendes. Uh, wonderful presentation and uh, very engaging indeed. Yeah. My question uh, is regarding the India-Sri Lanka relations under the Rajapaksa regime now. Uh, so the Rajapaksas have been continuously saying, even in February, they had said that India is a relation while other countries are friends. And four days ago also, uh, he has again mentioned Mahindra Rajapaksha that uh, the priority of our relations is going to be very much, uh, you know, with India. So the India-Sri Lanka relations are going to be highly prioritized. So in that sense, do you feel that for every um, action that has to be taken, it's going to be a phone call to China uh, and that's going to continue? Because I think there, there would be uh, some kind of... Uh, you know, shift in the way the Rajapaksas will behave uh, during the previous regime and now after coming back into power because they have, uh, you know, had to give away uh, the Humban Tota port and we know what 99 years really means when China is the benefactor. Uh, excellent question. You know, I mean, uh, I also carefully uh, uh, monitoring what is going on in Sri Lanka because that's where my heart is because I grew up in that country and I benefited from the university system. I still have a wonderful friends like uh, Professor Chandra Embuldenia and uh, Chak, who is also living in Sri Lanka and several others. Uh, which I noticed in the here. So, I mean, uh, uh, I'm closely monitoring now also in uh, South Asia's politics and uh, all the changes taking place because they are my relatives too. Who knows if uh, you and I have the same bloodline or the DNA somewhere with my uh, brother Swaran too. You know, we are all relatives. That is given. 
uh, in my way looking at things okay uh, so this is uh, beyond this politics and uh, uh, what uh, gotabe rajapaksa when he was elected uh, he said this our foreign policy is no more non alignment uh, which we had it from the gandhi's time or mrs bandaranaike's time suharto's time uh, and so forth and now we are a neutral country we want to work with the both but you know sri lanka is uh, been a very important strategically located uh, located island nation from historically because they have over uh, 2000 years of uh, recorded history 2500 years of recorded buddhist history and also the relationship with uh, europe and also with uh, uh, with uh, with the china even if you go to the china bay in trincomalee they still have a china bay that goes back to the 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 second capital of sri lanka so sri lanka has uh, this uh, remarkable connection with the sri lanka Uh, even my hometown of Polonnaruwa, uh, which uh, during my uh, king's time they sent uh, rice to China, and we imported some silk and other weapons to the our King Parakambau and so forth. So there is a remarkable connection. So you now I understand this is a bond uh, that we have it with the Buddhism, which we don't have it anymore with the India. Even uh, after King uh, Emperor Ashoka's time, Buddhism kind of pretty much disappeared, but it still prevail in. China. China and Sri Lanka there's a Buddhist connection remained so i can understand now that the president uh, rajapaksa said uh, we want to have a neutral uh, foreign policy we work with uh, our neighbors of the north and china and the us but in actuality what is important is the sri lanka's own self interest who would come to help you when we need the civil war during the ltt war tamil war they call it they went to india india does not want any more after indira gandhi uh, sajiv gandhi assassinated assassination went to the us they didn't help went to china they did china is a friend in need for sri lanka so this uh, current administration Uh, when uh, mahinda rajapaksa was the president and his uh, current president was the defense secretary and they get rid of this uh, this uh, terrorist element so now at least they bring him to the calm, calm sri lanka and at uh, trying to focus on the economic development now this uh, coronavirus came and a presidential election and then they have stability political stability in the country than the last 5 years they had bicker in between the two coalition parties so at least sri lanka come to uh, their own house together and to think about a neutral foreign policy makes sense but again when uh, sri lanka need that uh, money which is they are owe i think is uh, 4.5 billion dollars i look at the central bank numbers of sri lanka ceylon central bank and they owe uh, several millions dollars uh, 4.8 billion dollars they need to repay for their debt 10% to china it's not all just a 10% other to the asian development bank imf and the world bank and so forth how can you pay that and then they they have all the structural adjustment uh, rules uh, they say do this this and it is not the interest of the sri lanka so then when you were asked the corona virus time and the chinese government quickly delivered 500 million dollars to sri lanka as a loan to covid deal with it so in term of that one when sri lanka need help that the china is there so therefore if the india cannot help because of their your own issues in the domestic issues and policy issues financial issues they need to go to the bank they go to the bank to feed their own people sri lanka cannot simply afford to pay their own debt service so 4.4 billion dollars which is very high number to sri lanka and uh, when you uh, talk about uh, 55 billion foreign debt they have right now so when you look at it that one national interest self interest coming into mind even though president gotabe rajapaksa said i wanted to have a neutral foreign policy so this what i wanted to conclude to the answer your question my friend uh, rena is this 
we are all economic being. If you are carrying a wallet or a purse or a credit card, especially an American credit card, Visa card or MasterCard or American Express, you are a Hamiltonian. <laughs> and if you are going to the Coil and the mosque or the, uh, for the, uh, another religious place to worship and giving, uh, taking care of your beggars on the road and taking care of your neighbors, and thinking about the empathy and sympathy for others, you are a Hamil uh, Jeffersonian. So you are carrying a credit card, you are like acting like a Hamiltonian, but you are talking like a Jeffersonian. So now let me quote uh, another person that you and I already know, the father of economics. Adam Smith of Scotland, who wrote Wealth of Nation, said this, this remarkably applied to President Rajapaksa, Gotabe Rajapaksa. This is what it says, not Gotabe, but also Adam Smith said, I'm just quoting this one. Uh, Adam Smith said, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from the regard to their own self-interest. America can be a democracy, but you need to, to have your dinner tonight. It does not matter the brewer or the butcher who give you the dinner. It's not the benevolence of them that you come to the dinner, but your self-interest that you are going to the McDonald and KFC or to the street on the kitty corner of New Delhi Kanat place. Okay, thank you. Next uh, to make his intervention is Gaurav Datta. Please introduce yourself uh, and ask your question. Um, hello, Professor. Thank you for your presentation. Hello, hello nice to meet you. Um, I'm a PhD student at JNU uh, from the Center for Indo-Pacific ah. Studies. Uh, so my question to you is, uh, since you've looked back into American history, uh, when I look at the Cold War period, uh, when I look at containment strategy, I was, uh, you know, it reminds me of George F. Kennan, who was the father of containment strategy. So how do you see containment strategy in the uh, uh, I mean, nationalism and realism has, is a reality in the international scenario. So do you think the protection of a liberal international order uh, may not be as uh, efficient strategy for the Indo-Pacific, uh, within the concept of Indo-Pacific? Thank you. Yeah, uh, let me talk about uh, John Kennan, um, uh, the containment policy that uh, article, X article he wrote from the, uh, 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 X article he wrote from the, um, uh, from Soviet, uh, Soviet Union at that time. Uh, uh, does it work uh, this way? Let me give you an, another example, which is more more a real one, uh, which is that what exactly happened. Uh, during the Ronald Reagan's time, and uh, uh, Michael Gorbach Gorbachev was the Soviet uh, leader, and we, America, wants to, to bring down the Soviet Union, and uh, uh, how can they do this one containment uh, issue? Now is you want to bring down the country, uh, the so Soviet Union, another empire, pretty much. Uh, so this strategy was three folds. One is uh, Ronald Reagan sent uh, his uh, uh, to bring down the the oil prices which bring down the world oil prices and the economic survival of the Soviet Union collapsed because of exporting money coming from the oil export. Okay, that's the one part of the strategy. The second part of the strategy was the, uh, the Star Wars uh, uh, strategic defense initiative. And uh, that cannot compete with the technologically for the China, uh, Soviet Union. And uh, then uh, the strategy was to uh, galvanize the 
China, I mean, uh, the Soviet Union to, to compete with the US did not work. And uh, it is another second element of that strategy. The, the third one is the most important one, I think. At that time, uh, uh, William Casey, CIA director, was sent to Vatican, the Holy See in Rome, and asked uh, John Paul, the Pope, uh, uh, to work with him, uh, bring down the communism, because he is coming from the Polish country, Pol Poland. And the Poland, Lake Valencia, was there, and he worked with them and used the soft power and to bring down the Eastern Warsaw Pact. So therefore, these three strategies were working. The containment policy come to an end, and is the not the containment policy is the collapse of the Soviet Union. Very worried, but the China is different. China is a ninety-six million strong Communist Party. Think about this: the uh, Communist Party members. Young people are, it's very hard to get in. When I was teaching in Pudan, Xinhumin, and uh, City, or Tonji, or Nanjing, Wuhan, when I was teaching in these universities, I found out these young and bright people want to the Communist Party members. Very hard to get in, in. It's not like old days, they have to take the exam and they have to pass and the recommendation letter, just like getting a job. They are hardcore believers in the Communist Party. You cannot change the, the mindset. This is into this, the whole system. It is same like President Donald Trump's Christian evangelical people. You cannot change them. You can put a pig in front of that one. If the President Trump said, this is a pig. No, 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 this is not a pig, this is a cow. They believe, if they said, Oh, don't put this uh, cover. You are strong enough. You are American. Uh, this coronavirus does not impact you. Don't believe in this science. Don't believe in Poochie. They believe in it. What would happen to America? Third largest death rate after US and also. The question is, you have this kind of mindset, this is very hard to, to change in uh, Beijing. So it is ridiculous for us to bring down that system at this one, you know, this, you can have uh, this collapse theories, collapse already collapse in, uh, in, in terms of uh, China, but you need to, to understand China as the way Chinese understand China, especially the young people. So now they're coming into the containment system. Can we contain China? China, Soviet Union. It's never been. Stalin even ridiculed Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong didn't like him. He was treated like a child. They don't want to be the Soviet Union, the collapse. So they are the ancient, very this is the only civilization is still thriving in the world. No Nile, Mohandajaro Harap, or the Tigris Euphrates, no Aztec. But Chinese civilization is uh, revival. It has a strategy, it has very thoughtful way to look at the world. This is the celestial empire in the making. Now, containment issue, how can you con the earliest civilization, 500 years before colonial powers came in to colonize you and me in Sri Lanka, Portuguese, the British. Before that, the most powerful country in the world was a Chinese civilization for 500 plus years during the Ming dynasty. You can see at uh, advancement of maritime technology itself. So containment is kind of, uh, 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 I do not think it would work uh, uh, because this is not the Soviet Union. Other point I want to, to tell you is uh, this is a civilization. This Yugoslavia controlled by Marshal Tito, by military power, but it, it is the mindset, the mind, if you 
control this, you can control everything. That's what China does on Sri Lanka. Nobody talks about against China because it's a Buddhist country. We have a historic. But the American, they went to war in the Vietnam, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, the, uh, Iraq, and so forth. This is the mindset. This is, uh, it is what is. If you control this, they control that. China does it that uh, very wonderful way. That is what uh, they are trying to do the, with the Indian population until you recognize this, uh, the, the TikTok and others are aha. This is a part of this is the political warfare that is going to go in place. So I do not think uh, containment policy would work. You can put this, you can look at it this way. Four years, we are trying to control Iran by sanctions, other means. We are trying to control North Korea. We are trying to control Venezuela. How successful were Americans on these three fronts? China is not North Korea. China is not Venezuela. Any other countries. It is uh, still thriving civilization with uh, mind is the forerunner. Just like a Buddha said, mind is the forerunner. And uh, that nature works. The nature's God is America called. So that's the part. Part the second part we can talk about as we go along, and the uh, the uh, issue of liberal order. There is no such thing called the liberal order. It's a misnomer. We think after World War World War Two, we created a war. Wars, uh, wars, uh, the democracies don't go to the wars. I mean, it is not really true. But we were taught to believe in that way. Now we are being challenged. Chinese way of uh, uh, governance, the philosophical governance, is very important to them themselves. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We'll have a uh, uh, last uh, set of questions now, very quickly. In the next five minutes, we'll close it. Uh, you were trying to ask a question. You, I saw you raising hand. One minute, followed by Neetu Kumari in another one minute, and I think Ghazala can ask question next time. So just two questions, and we'll close it after this. Uh, Dr. Patrick, thank you for the presentation. Is during your presentation, you have referred to Indian Ocean as a West, uh, China's Western Ocean. Could you please elaborate what you are trying to say? Uh, Western Ocean is that given by the Admiral to recognize there is uh, several concept in uh, china chinese believe there is the north ocean which they they have a western ocean which they don't but they have a east ocean which is east china sea they have a south ocean south china sea northern part is the north o you can call it uh, an thing but uh, for the western ocean journey to the west the going on to the west from the Xi'an to Urumushi, modern day, coming to Kashmir and to India or to Pakistan at that time, I mean, now then uh, India, and all the way to the Indian subcontinent. It is the journey to the west. That is the Western Ocean for them, even though technically it's not, uh, but their mindset, the power of the mind. You believe the <coughs> North Ocean. East Ocean, South Ocean, and the Western Ocean. So Admiral Chung Ho thought we are going to the Western Ocean. It's just like Christopher Columbus want to go to the trade war, a trade wind took the, him to the Caribbean. So when they went over there, he said, oh, West Indies, because the West wind took him to so-called the Caribbean, now he called the West Indies. So now Christopher Columbus thing is the West Indies. So he still we call the West Indies. So in years to come, now the China is a powerful country and is take over the Djibouti and the African countries and uh, uh, other uh, littoral, uh, uh, the maritime countries. They can say, hey, 
you need to recognize this Indian notion is the Western notion. Thank you. Neetu Kumari, please ask your question and mute yourself. Yes. So, sir, I'm Neetu Kumari from GNU and currently I'm working as an professor in National Law University. My question is like uh, related to the Trojan horse concept. For example, like ASEAN is considered as ASEAN is currently also considered as a Trojan horse of America. So, what you are thinking that the, this is the invisible war between uh, US and China? It will like some country will use as a tool by China by uh, China and US as a Trojan horse against the China. So, uh, like how those country who is like very good friend of US. Like what kind of careful things the country should adopt? Same things for China also, because China is also using certain country against India or like uh, to control over India and other country. So what is your uh, like idea or suggestions for those countries? Thank you. Excellent uh, question, Nito. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I actually wrote about the, the word Trojan uh, horse. Uh, you can Google uh, uh, me, find out that article. Thank you for asking. Uh, uh, yes, America has uh, the SOFA agreement and access to all the countries uh, for militarily, uh, which is about, I think it's 123 countries, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, different agreement to AXA agreement. They call the access agreement. That's one we, we have it with the US. Uh, I don't think, uh, yes, they are going to have sign it. I, I didn't follow up on that one. India is trying to do that one as well. Access, that means the American military aircraft and the ships can land on your, your, your ports and the airports and so forth. They have it with the Sri Lanka. There are uh, some AXA, AXA, AXA agreement with uh, I think 120 countries. So you can call it the Trojan Wars, but it is the, what I call it the empire of liberty to, pre to protect their interest or the pre uh, navigation of uh, freedom of navigation issues, because that is the ultimate objective of the Jeffersonian world that the US want to create. So in order to get there, we always go with the military. It's the same way that uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, talking about this is uh, freedom and all those things. And then uh, every time we send the uh, ships around the world, uh, even the, uh, when we send the emperors of China, to, from New York Harbor to Canton, modern day Guangdong or Guangzhou. So we send the military ships with it. So every time we go with the trade, we send the military aircraft, military ship to protect them. Otherwise there are piracy and other things and that's why they have uh, this military, they are to protect. Now we are calling the piracy and other things. Uh, India does that one uh, in the uh, Horn of Africa or the Malacca and Indian Ocean and so forth. And uh, India has uh, their own military bases with the Americans and uh, uh, Chinese and uh, Indian forces are in Mauritius, for example. So therefore, this is, uh, you can call it a Trojan Wars or some, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter, but, but when you look at the China, when they give these loans which they cannot pay, they know that one. They are not worried about financial aspect, but they are concerned about once they have a debt, they are on their side. I remember, the Thomas uh, John Adams, who our second president said, if you want to enslave a country, you fight with the sword or you make them debt. China is very brilliant. They are used in our second president wisdom. And finally, let me say that uh, uh, our job just like uh, Professor Swaran and Professor Mina and so forth. Um, uh, our job is not to take anything. Our academic is to see things as they are, trying to understand the history and to interpret it, the, how this is going to impact. The politicians and our leaders have to make the choices what they want to do, what kind of world that we want to create. That's why we elected them. Okay, well, elected in some countries, not others. But uh, this is how our system works. So essentially, the, this is a Trojan horse is taken out in Sri Lanka. I think I wrote that word is, uh, is uh, 
Sri Lanka's Buddhist diplomacy is a Trojan horse. I think that's the, something I, you can see the Colombo page or somewhere they publish it, that article. Actually, they republish it. Uh, uh, most of my articles are republished elsewhere, which I even don't know. So essentially what is happening is uh, uh, what you said, smaller countries don't have a choice whether you want to go this way or that way. So again, uh, these countries need to think about uh, what is good for their own population, their own people, given their own tradition uh, and interest, uh, and to talk about what is best for my friend, my people. But that is becoming increasingly difficult. Some of the countries, the rulers, are not even the citizens of their own countries. This creates the question in Australia, New Zealand, even Sri Lanka, and even in the Maldives. So they are, happen to be Americans. So this is the another question. Are they are the instrument of these powerful countries? or actually they come back home for the love of their country. Or after their election or lost of their election, they go back to California or to North Carolina or to Florida or Texas. Thank so you. that is the question, that's the love of the freedom. Thank you, Patrick. You are an example yourself of uh, being a global citizen. <laughs> no, in my case, I, case, uh, I have a different a privilege than any other Americans because I went over there as an exchange scholar to high school and then I returned to Sri Lanka to Sri Jayawardenapura and returned because that uh, that Minnesota community raised money and asked me to come back because of the war started again so I make the uh, I also serve as a Sri Lankan youth ambassador under President uh, Premadasa. Uh, so I serve my country in many different ways, uh, which I cannot elaborate. Um, uh, um, but uh, I made the conscious, uh, uh, conscious decision that no American, bo American born citizen have. I make the choice. I has the uh, uh, um, uh, special privilege given to me, make the choice whether you want to be American. So not only the American people, but I serve in China, in Europe, and even I work with uh, my friends and colleagues in India. So once you have this uh, mindset, we are not alone, we are together. If something happened in Jambu Kashmir or Assam, or oh, China, Madras, or Chennai, it hurts me too. At the same way something happened in my hometown, or in Colombo, or Sri Lanka, there's a bomb in went off a year ago in the churches. It hurts me too. At the same way, the Minneapolis police officer put his leg on an African-American in Minneapolis, where I used to teach at the University of Minnesota. It hurts me too. So it does not matter whether you are a Sri Lankan living in China or America or now in Taiwan. We are all together. We see it and we know it. But why we are behaving differently is another matter. Yes, uh, you're right. As uh, Yuval Noah Harari in his very popular book, Sapiens, has made us all aware we ultimately all come from Ethiopia. So, of course, we are all connected <laughs> as homo sapien. And that connection very often uh, is emotional. Yeah. And though we are trying to do either celestial empire building or commercial empire building, uh, you know, those discourses uh, uh, continue to, of course, uh, guide our destinies in many ways. Um, excellent presentation. I was so delighted to hear you uh, give a broad sweep uh, of historical perspective, I think that is very, very uh, important takeaway for me today uh, of how China had inspired even the American leaders and they wanted to build a civilization and a state uh, looking at China as an example. Uh, uh, before you close, let me uh, just close in my part uh, uh, another um, uh -huh. 
uh, you know, uh, lighthearted way. Uh, often when I walk in America, especially because I grew up with the white Americans in northern Minnesota, uh, often they ask me, they never seen a non-white in their life before when I went to northern Minnesota. It's a white lily place. And uh, they ask me, are you Indian? <laughs> then I take it back. I said, Cherokee. Because you don't probably know the joke of that story, because in India, I mean, China, US has 500 different Indian tribes. The Cherokee is one of the Indian tribes. So when people ask me, are you an Indian? I simply say, I'm Cherokee. So then they laugh, those who know the history of America. So bottom line, what I wanted to say is this. We are all Indians. We work for somebody else. Thank you so much. With that, I'll hand over now to my colleague, uh, Professor Rina Marwa, to propose vote of thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patrick Mendes. I think um, we have had so much of feedback coming back to us, uh, people telling us that they have really enjoyed your presentation. And as Professor Swaran said, that you brought us, took us all the way back, you know, thousands of years and brought us to the present and connected all the dots so beautifully and also brought out the significance of uh, Taiwan and uh, Sri Lanka in the global architecture, which is, uh, take, you know, which is uh, fast transforming and also bringing it back uh, the vision of China for uh, you know, how the maritime uh, supremacy is becoming extremely important for them from the East China Sea, South China Sea, and uh, with their eyes uh, soon coming towards uh, the Western uh, Ocean of theirs and the Indian Ocean. And of course, we know that the costliest pearl in the Indian Ocean is Sri Lanka. And uh, the influence of China in Sri Lanka, I think you have again, uh, you know, uh, elucidated uh, very wonderfully and said that, you know, how all decisions are taken, all meaningful decisions, <laughs> meaningful actions that are taken by China and how you need to keep going back to China because you need support for all the 4.5 billion dollar debt that you have. Uh, so these, with these words, I would really like to thank you on my behalf, on uh, the behalf of our president, Professor Swaran Singh, and the uh, Association of Asia Scholars, and all the participants. A big thank you to each one for joining us from different places. And please do stay connected with our next uh, Wednesday's webinar will be on Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi as a critic of uh, liberalism and the talk will be by Dr. Faisal Devji, professor of Indian history from the University of Oxford. So again, we are going to look at uh, the historical narrative and uh, thank you once again uh, for joining us. I'm sure it's almost evening for you in uh, Taiwan now, early evening. So four, thank four, you. After four o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> so it's into the evening already, but uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, exposition of your ideas and uh, thank you to all our participants, to our Association of Asia Scholars team who is working dedicatedly uh, behind the scenes and you will soon have the report of the webinar as well along with the recording. So the recording will also be the entire recording will be there on our Facebook page uh, by tomorrow evening. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we now prepare to uh, work towards our international conference on revisiting Gandhi at end of this month, 30th and 31st, all Wednesday webinars are organized by various celebrated international scholars on Gandhi. And coming Wednesday will be the first of those five speakers who will speak on Gandhi. And the first one, as Reena just mentioned, is Faisal Devji, who's a professor of history at the University of Oxford and a scholar on Gandhi. 
we will deliver the first lecture on gandhi followed by other four before we move into our international conference on 30th and 31st so please spread the word around that we want to spend entire month focusing on understanding gandhi again during this 150th anniversary celebrations that india has thank you so much everybody yeah, thank you thank you very much it's very interesting we would like to give our ideas more and we should work together as a global citizens thank Bye. you thank you so much stay safe and well everyone mm -hmm. Yes. And same to you all of you. And thank you again, Jock and uh, Chandra and Vincenio. I can see them, and my other Indian friends are already over there. I wanted to thank each, each and every one of you. Thank you. Also, thank you, Soren. And uh, I will talk to you soon. Right. Thank you so much.